I'm Luis Sabatasso. Welcome to Real Talk. Today we'll be talking to Greg Baldwin. Greg worked for CBS for eight years and then went on a 10-year meth run. Greg. <laughs> Louis. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, it's great to be here. What are your earliest memories of childhood? <sighs> My earliest memories of childhood, um, I, I don't know, I, I probably, I had, I had a really good upbringing. I remember like baseball was like my thing. I always had a baseball uniform on and uh, I, my parents were amazing and their kids were always out playing at, at the school. And this was in the early 70s. 70s, yeah, yes. early 70s. All right, so TV was a huge part of your life. Mm -hmm. Six Million Dollar Man. Mm -hmm. Bio Bionic Woman. Bionic Woman. Yeah, yes. cartoons. Cartoons, Saturday morning cartoons. Saturday morning cartoons. But I was always out on the uh, plane. Yeah. You know, uh, we we're always getting in trouble with fireworks and stuff, you know, just fooling around. What was life like at home? It was great. Uh, you know, I, I don't think it was a very affectionate home, uh, but I had a great childhood. My parents were like, I don't know, my mom was always like, whatever I wanted to do, she would support it. So she would always encourage me to do the things that I enjoyed. Um, like, you know, I did like modeling and baseball and just, you know, whatever my, she always gave me the, 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 uh, courage and, uh, support to do whatever I wanted to pursue. So I think that led, uh, to later in life, uh, kind of who I am is, is taking risks and, and following my dreams. Baseball was huge, but I started playing baseball when I was, uh, seven. And baseball has always been like the most important thing in my life. As uh, you know, I grew up; I was an athlete. And uh, um, but we, you know, in my backyard, we had a ladder going up the our my backyard fence to the school. Mm -hmm. And so we were always playing, and and uh, there was tons of kids around our neighborhood. It was it was a great upbringing. I think today you don't see kids out playing as much without guide, you know, supervision because of. It's just a different time. I no. think things things were different back in our day. Different. I started off in little league in the minors, and then I uh, then you go to AAA, and then I played in the majors. Uh, but I was on the All Stars when I was tw uh, eleven and when I was twelve years old, and we made it to the state championship on the All Star team. And uh, I just always I always love to be. I love the adrenaline. I love being in the limelight. I love the pressure. Um, it's just something that, you know, I, I'm, I think, I don't know if I'm a, an adrenaline junkie, but I just love uh, the competition. You were a good baseball player. I was a good baseball player, yeah. yeah. I ended up playing through college. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you're a really good baseball player. I was good. I was yeah, I was pretty good. And we never wanted to play in the minors or anything after 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 college? Yeah, I, I don't know. I was, I, I, I was pretty skinny. Uh, mm -hmm. I was like 130 pounds. Um, and I played outfield, so... Uh, in my senior year in college, I made all league, but uh, I busted my hand in all fall ball. And uh, I just don't think, you know, they were looking for, as far as outfield goes, they were looking for six foot two, 200 pounds, people that can hit the ball out of the park. Yeah. You know? Physically, you didn't have the. Uh, I, I didn't have the attributes physically, but I had yeah. the eye hand coordination and the, uh, the hitting skills. And, uh, but yeah, was, baseball was my life. Then your parents, everybody was very supportive of baseball? Yeah. Yeah, they would always come to the games, and uh, I miss it. That was my that would be my first choice of professions if I was a professional baseball player. Professional baseball player. When baseball was gone, mm -hmm. what did you what did you replace it with? Music has always been my thing. I've always had a uh, I've been going to concerts since I was in seventh grade. And uh, what was your first concert? Black Sabbath Mob Rules Tour. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I think my first rock concert was ACDC. ACDC, that's yes. a good one. What tour? I ran away from For those home. about to rock? Yes, and I ran away from home to be able to go to the concert when I was Did 13. you really? Oh, yeah. For those about to rock with the cannons? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I went to that concert. Yeah, that was, that was amazing. That, yeah. And the Michael Jackson Victory Tour. Oh, that's, that's a good one. Of my, that's that's a good also one. one of my first ones at, uh, at, uh, at Dodger Stadium. When, did, when was your first drink? My first addiction was candy. So I, I, I would always eat candy and... and probably not brush my teeth enough and I started getting cavities. So I went to the dentist and they gave me the laughing gas, nitrous, nitrous oxide. Yeah. And I didn't know about anything about getting high or anything. And I remember they put the mask on me and I fell off into this dream uh, that I was on a Vikings helmet and I was like <laughs> wrapped around his helmet and I was running down some stairs 
And I remember the dentist saying, you know, uh, every once in a while saying, open your mouth, open your mouth, open your mouth, open your mouth. And I, I remember like, I just remember like it was crazy. It was like Disneyland on steroids. And then at one point it felt like I was on my head and my feet were straight in the air and my whole body was tingly. And it was like, the, and I remember the night just wore off, you know, and the, the teeth work was done. And I remember thinking to myself, like, I know what I want to do for the rest of my life. We're now going to have a state of the recovery business conversation with Andrew Spanswick, the owner of Clean, who is our primary sponsor. There is a cancer right now on the recovery industry. It's body brokering. It's mm -hmm. uh, people being paid to relapse so they could recharge the insurance company. Right. Uh, all these sober livings that are popping up and being paid for by IOPs. Yeah, and, it, and it's because, honestly, that's illegal. it's hurt clean substantially. That type of behavior, that criminal behavior, has made a huge impact on our census. Um, it's bouncing back now because a lot of those people are going to jail. But a lot of Thank people God. died and a lot of people got hurt during this period of uh, lack of regulation and lack of law enforcement. People have called it like the Wild West. It's like it became like the Wild West. It is, you know business. what the Wild West is? The Wild West is a place where there's no enforcement of the laws, right? In the Wild West, it's still legal to shoot somebody, but if nobody's around, who the hell cares, right? So that's sort of what's going on right now. Finally, the federal government is stepping in and they're using RICO statutes to deal with body brokering and, and other scams and kickbacks and all this kind of stuff. And they're using RICO statutes, so What's dangerous for people like myself that do it honestly and have been doing it honestly is that RICO statues, if anyone that I'm involved with that might be doing it, even without my knowledge, I become a third party to that and I'm still under the RICO statue. So I could actually be indicted for something that I don't know anything about as a legitimate running operator. So it's making us have to be extra cautious and we're having to bring all of our services in-house. Marketing becomes not just uh, a way to tell people about the type of help we can offer and show them that there's a solution to their problems and that we can get them better. But now it also becomes a huge business risk management issue where I have to make sure that nothing is said that's incorrect at the call center or you know, with our marketers. And it's hard for me to monitor all those people. So we have to record all that and review it. And it's just another thing that takes away time from me and clinicians and other people that are trying to provide real solutions. But it's a necessary part, unfortunately, in this world because, uh, you know, when this much money starts flowing around easily, when people feel that they don't really have to provide a real solution, they just have to have a fancy product with some branding and they just have to pay to get clients or they have to pay Google a bunch of money to get a referral, you know, that becomes an opportunity for people to, to scam money out of people. I'm Louis Sabatasso and we are back with Greg Baldwin. So what happened? I was dating a girl, and she, I found uh, a meth pipe on her, like a bubble pipe. And I remember thinking to myself, oh my god, she's a junkie, right? As I had done everything else, but I confronted her with it, and I'm like, you smoke this stuff? And she's like, sometimes, and she's like, do you want to try it? And I'm like, of course. All right, I'll try it. And I took a hit off the meth pipe. And I'll tell you exactly what it was like. It was just like that day in the dentist chair yeah. uh, when I was young. And, and it was the most incredible feeling I've ever felt. So I started using meth a lot. And what happened was um, I slowly started losing my ability to function in society. When, do you, when did you recognize it really, really turning on you? When did you recognize the meth in your addiction really, really turning on you? I was a theater actor at the Actors Theater of San Francisco, and I uh, stayed up all night one night using meth, and, I, and I, d I couldn't stop, and I had to go perform at a show, and I remember thinking, like, I'm in trouble. I'm in big trouble, because I knew... What was that night like? I think I got through it okay. Uh, Take me back to that night on stage at, at this performance when you had that feeling that you were in trouble? I just, re here's what I remember from it, because it's, it's a little foggy. I remember like going to the show, and I remember thinking, you know, and I'd been up all night, and I remember thinking, like, this isn't good. Th this is not good. And to be up on stage in front of all these people and like, and, and, and being on drugs, 
was a different level. That was a uh, that was another level for me that that I've never you know that I was afraid of. That was your place. That was the baseball field. That yeah. was under the lights. That yeah. was with the attention. Yeah. And you were up there, and you had that moment. Yeah. And realized you were in trouble in that moment. My boss at CBS w kept asking me like, "Are you okay? Is everything okay?" And I knew I was using meth at, at, at work in the bathroom, and I knew like things were not going to end well because I couldn't stop. And so I, I was going to transfer to L.A. to go to work for K-Rock um, in Los Angeles. So I decided to, you know, leave the CBS there, and I figured I'd move to L.A. to get away from drugs. And so um, I moved down to L.A. to try to get away from, from the meth, and I found it down in L.A., and I kept using it. I went to an interview with K-Rock, and that job fell through, and I, I, I went on an interview with ABC, and I had a bag of meth in my pocket. And uh, I and I thought I killed the interview, right? And I, so I, I did, you know, but I was using. So I did the interview, and there was a hole in my pocket at ABC in, in Los Angeles, and the meth fell down my pant leg mm. and fell out of the ground, uh, out on the ground at ABC. And we're walking out, and he grabs the meth off the ground, and he's like, "What's this?" And he held it up, and I snatched it out of his hand, and I said, "Vitamins." And he's like. Okay. Uh, well, all right. Let me show you to the door. And he escorted me out. He didn't believe you. Well, I mean, it was obvious. <laughs> it was obvious. It was drugs. And I remember walking out, and it was cold, total and complete devastation. Was it similar to the feeling that you had on stage that night? Yeah, but worse. This was this was worse. Because now, all of a sudden, my radio career was over. I thought, and uh, what is it? Uh, incomprehensible demoralization. I moved back in with my parents and I actually went to work for another radio station. It was called K-Fox. And the guy... Who what was your relationship like with your parents at this point? Was your mom still very encouraging? Was she still supportive of yeah. you? Was she still uh, kind of not really co-signing everything that you did, but was she still, uh, you know, you're sort of the golden child and you can't really, he can't make a mistake and mm -hmm. he's and sort of kind of sugarcoating everything that you're doing. Mm -hmm when you were back at home with your, with your parents? They didn't know the extent of the problem. They knew something was wrong, uh, but they didn't know the extent of it. So they would like give me money and try to help me get back on my feet because what they had seen me do, you know, they've always seen me like go to college and be a great baseball player and go to work for my favorite radio station. I would take them, I took my parents backstage to like these concerts and uh, I was in the theater company doing all these plays they'd come watch and they'd hear me on the radio and they'd hear my commercials on the radio. So they saw me, that's how they saw me. So. They were probably, there was probably some, you know, level of denial, but they were trying to help me get back on my feet. And I was, you know, I'm a master manipulator. So, um, you know, the signs were starting to show up and it was, it was hard and they kept like kicking. What were the signs? Uh, uh, thinness, uh, gaunt, you, you, when you, when you use meth, you start looking like gaunt, like your face starts getting sunken in. Um, Lies. Come Would they say anything to you? Like, are you not eating? Why are you so thin? Yeah. Why are your teeth falling out? Yeah. Yeah. I'd come, you know, I'd be out for days and then, you know, I'd show back up and then sleep for a day. And, you know, but again, you know, they were trying, I think there was some, they were in denial, you know. And then my dad kept kicking me out of the house, you know. I was, I don't know, 30 years, 30 something years old. And they kept kicking me out of the house and I just kept coming back. And uh, it was devastating. It had to be devastating for them. But they watched me slowly deteriorate, and I was dying. You know, I was having a lot of teeth problems. There was shame, especially, you know, getting, leaving the last radio station I was working for my friend. And the last thing he said to me when I left that radio station was they were throwing a party for me, like a going away party, you know, and I was late because I was up all night. And he, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, He's like, dude, I hired you and I took a chance on you and you've burned me. You totally burned me. He goes, get out of this, get out of here. Just leave. I don't want to talk to you, I don't want to see you. And I remember leaving there with that shame and I, f I felt so horrible. Did that bring up the same sort of shame um, as was being brought up from being living with your parents and going through all of this and your parents were seeing you all sucked up? So, uh, you know what, I mean, I was so out of my mind, yeah. and I think, you know, what I kept doing is I just kept getting high and not, like, dealing with it. And so, you know, you know, using meth, what happens when you use meth is, like, releases, like, 
like the everything's okay signals in your brain. So I, I would keep I would keep saying to myself like, you know, I'm gonna pull out of this. I, yeah. you know, I didn't realize I looked as bad as other people were seeing. You know, I moved moved in with my buddy who was a pr uh, producer of uh, on the morning show. We went to a radio event one night. I was talking to one of the listeners, and I'm like, oh yeah, I'm living at Maddie's house. And the listener said, oh my God, you're the drug addict? <laughs> and I'm like, what? And they're like, yeah, they're talking about you, you know, on the morning show all the time, you know, and uh, where I used to work. Yeah. They wouldn't say my name, but um, I'm like, oh man. They were telling Maddie to kick me out because I, they were enabling my behavior. But the, the end happened, the beginning of the end happened for me when uh, my friend Maddie, the producer, was getting married in Vegas, and he bought me, uh, he gave me money for a plane ticket and uh, to go out and fly out, and uh, I didn't go, and I spent the money on drugs, and I ended up getting arrested. And I got arrested for, for possession. And so when I was supposed to be at the wedding, I was in jail. So now you're, you're, in, you're in jail, mm -hmm. uh, not at the wedding, mm -hmm. when you're supposed to be at the wedding. Mm -hmm. That, that couldn't have felt good. Yeah. When as soon as I got out of jail, they had parked my car. I had parked my car, and I had drugs in the car that they didn't find, and I just went straight back to using. You know, got my stuff, got out of my, the, his house, and then went back to my parents' house and, and kept using. And uh, you know, I got down to 118 pounds. So the baseball player. Yeah. Mom, mama's little angel. Mm -hmm. Light of her life. 118 pounds, arrested instead of being at your friends. Yeah, and I was completely devastated. And I, I got, I got, had a probation officer, uh, like a pre-trial probation officer, and I, and I kept testing dirty for the drug, for, on the drug tests. And I kept thinking to myself, if it gets any worse than this, I'm going to go to the Golden Gate Bridge and jump off. How close were you to going to the Golden Gate Bridge and jumping off? You know, I don't know if I would ever have the courage to kill myself, but you know, I, I just lost. I completely lost my ability to function in society, and I had no hope. Did you ever drive to the Golden Gate Bridge? And no, no, never got that close. But I thought about it. You know, the thought would come up a lot. You know, it was it was devastating. And now a piece from Sober Grid Lifestyles. There's a simple thing you can do to improve your communication with others. In this video, let's talk about one word you can eliminate from your vocabulary to improve your recovery. Wow. You're probably wondering what that word is, but I'm not going to tell you. Except I just told you, right now. The word that's better left behind is but. And I don't mean booty or badongadong or behind but b-u-t but what does but really mean and yeah can you please just add a but counter to the bottom here thank you but is used to introduce a phrase or clause contrasting with what has already been mentioned so like he stumbled but didn't fall or i hear what you're saying but i think something else what it actually does is say forget everything i just said only listen to this part which is helpful if you're talking about something that just changed like it used to be like like that but it's like this now it's not so helpful when you're talking with somebody though so if you tell me how you feel and I say well I understand how you feel but I think something else I'm really just saying I'm not listening to you I don't care what you say which is not very helpful when you're trying to tell somebody that you are listening to them and you do care about what they say there are two things I do instead one thing I can do is a hard stop an example of this would be, I understand what you're saying. I have a different opinion. I believe saying it like that still values what the other person is saying and lets them know that I care about what they have to say. The second thing I can do is change that but to and. So I understand what you're saying and I think something else. It sounds less like you're wrong and I'm right. It's saying that these two things exist at the same time. You believe something and I believe something. And they're both equally important. So in short, try to use but a little less frequently in your life. You might see some big changes. Thanks for watching and hope you enjoy the rest of the show. And we are now going to wrap up with Greg Baldwin. My grandma, when she was alive, she saved all of our coins all of her life. And she had this huge box, like a giant box of all these silver dollars and quarters and dimes. and, and 
uh, my grandma died and she left the coins to my mom. And my mom always told me, you know, when we pass, we're going to give you these coins. And I went in my mom's closet and I found the coins and I started stealing them. Did she ever confront you? Yeah. So what happened was she realized I was taking the coins. And she came up to me and she said, uh, I'll never forget this. My mom said to me, you're taking grandma's coins. Like, you're taking grandma's coins. And I remember the look in my, my, my mom's eyes and the devastation. And I remember, you know, I, I, at that moment I realized I was killing my mom. You know, like physically, literally killing her through stress and worry and lack of sleep. And I saw the devastation in my mom's eyes. And at that point I realized that my addiction wasn't just affecting me, but it was affecting the people around me. It was like a God shot or a moment of clarity and I'm like, oh my God, I need help. I was done. Something happened. Like something happened, something changed in me. And- uh, You knew you were done. I knew I was done. I, you know, I went to, here's what I went to rehab for. I always thought, I thought rehab, you know, was for, you know, getting clean was so I can get my life back. I just wanted to be normal. I wanted to be a normal human being. And so I just totally surrendered. I gave up and uh, I was ready to change. You know, they started giving me direction. They told me to, you know, they told me to make my bed in the morning. I made my, I would make my bed. They told me to do dishes on Wednesday nights. I did dishes. They told me to read, you know, a recovery book. I read the recovery book. They told me to help the newcomer that came into the rehab after me. I did that. Whatever they told me to do, I would do. Where was your family at this point? And my parents didn't, you know, they were, they were devastated. You know, they had enough. And uh, I have one cousin, Stephanie, she would always send me cookies. <laughs> When I was in rehab, she would send me these cookies, and uh, everybody loved her chocolate chip cookies. So you knew you were done. Indeed, it yeah. proved that you were done because yeah. you have not used since then. It's yeah. been how long? 11 years. 11, 11 years and four months. And what is your life like now? I'll tell you one of the most powerful things that happened uh, in early recovery is that, you know, I started working again. And uh, I started working, and I started saving up my money. And... <sighs> What happened was when I remember at the beginning of my, my at the beginning of my recovery, I would think about those coins, and I would have this like overwhelming sense of like guilt and shame and remorse, and I would think of those coins, and I'd be like, like I'm such a loser. I hated myself, and I hated myself for for doing that. I went back to that pawn shop that I had pawned all my grandma's coins and my coins, and I bought them all back, and I returned them to my mom, and what happened is I started getting this sense of peace and comfort. So now when I think of those coins, you know, I don't have that guilt and shame and remorse. I think of those coins and I'm like, I'm good. I did a panel at a, at a place called the Claire Foundation and I shared my story. And there was a woman at the beginning, there's three of us, there was a woman at the beginning of the panel and she was like totally crying and bawling. And I went up to her and I said, everything's gonna be okay. And she smiled. And at that moment, I realized that I had something to offer. And what did that turn into? What did that become with the jail panels? Yeah. So I started speaking in jail. I got cleared to speak in jail panels. And then I got voted in as director of jails. That was my title, director of jails. <laughs> oh, that's so awesome. And I dealt with the sheriffs. And, uh, uh, and you know, and, and I started new panels. And I started programs. And, and I helped, uh, like, you know, a lot of people get jail clearance. It was like the greatest thing I've ever done. And then at the, uh, then I became director of the whole program uh, after being director of jails. But something really significant happened that changed everything for me. I was doing a panel and I, there was this kid in there and I did it like, you know, a few months in a row and I kept seeing him and he came up to me and, he's, and he tells me he's getting out on Friday. And, uh, and he asked me what I should do and what he should do. And I said, well, you come meet me at this uh, recovery meeting, you come meet me and I'll introduce you to some people who will help you get started in recovery. And so uh, Friday came around, I went to the meeting, he didn't show up, uh, I didn't even think about it, but he didn't show up. And like four months after that, I was at that meeting and I saw like this kid staring at me. And I'm like, this, you, know, you know when you can feel someone staring at you? And I'm like, That's, this is weird, there's like guys staring at me. And then all of a sudden he like got up and started running after, like running towards me and I'm like, I'm like, hey, man, what's going on? And he's like, do you rem remember me? 
And I'm like, no. And he's like, from jail. He goes, I got out, I started drinking. And I'm like, yeah, I can believe that. And, uh, and he goes, but I hit another bottom. And he goes, and I came here looking for you like three months ago, but you weren't here. And he goes, I raised my hand as a newcomer and like all these people surrounded me and they got me into a sober living. And he goes, I'm sober three months. And I'm like, oh, that's amazing, man. You know, congratulations. And we stayed in contact. And uh, on my, I think it was my four year, or it's five, I'm not sure, but he, uh, on my sobriety birthday, he wrote me a card that was a page and a half that told me all the things that happened to him as a direct result of him uh, meeting me in jail and him going to that recovery meeting. And at the end of the card, he thanked me for saving his life. And uh, uh, about a year, a year after that, he was, I went to uh, this recovery group thing, and he was speaking. He was a speaker. And he shared his story, and he started talking about how he was incarcerated in L.A. County Jail, and he, how he was introduced to recovery while I was in jail. And he said there was one guy that came into the jail and said something that saved his life. And he looked at me and he smiled. Was there ever a moment in your life where you had a greater sense of self-esteem or self-worth in that moment? No, I had a moment of clarity. And I realized that recovery wasn't about me getting my life back and my job and my career, you know. And then I, re I also realized it wasn't just about that freedom that I got from getting those coins back and making amends and doing all that. I realized that recovery is about service. You know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe it's a little bit about all of it. Maybe I have to, uh, you know, have that feeling of freedom and, and peace, you know, from, uh, from making amends so I can be passionate about recovery. Maybe I have to have a job and be self-supporting and, and, you know, and be, so I can be uh, a good example. But ultimately, the way I keep my recovery is I give it away and to be of service. That kid that I met, uh, I ended up getting him jail clearance, and him and I went back to the same jail he was incarcerated in, and we did a panel together. It was wow. like the coolest thing in the world. It was the, you know, and he's still clean and sober. You know, he's an associate producer on all these reality TV shows, and we stay in contact and stuff, but uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's amazing. My biggest obstacle in life has become my biggest asset, and now I know what my primary purpose is on, on this earth. It's to be a service to other people. Amazing. Thank you so much, Greg, for coming in. Yeah. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. My name is Louis Sabatasso. Thank you so much for watching, and if you like what you saw, please like, comment, share, let us know.